Hey, this is not a real episode of The Booketing. I want that to be very strictly understood so that you're not disappointed when it is not a real episode of The Booketing. Make you no promises, tell you no lies. But I do want to check in with our dear listeners and tell them why they're not getting, tell you why you're not getting a new episode of The Booketing this Wednesday. Hi, this is Nathan of The Booketing. If this is your first episode of The Booketing, I do not recommend that this be the first episode of The Booketing that you listen to because it's an episode all about how it's not an episode of The Booketing and I don't think it will really be an episode. This is just a check-in. It's just a check-in. So very briefly, I hope you like the new, well, it's not really new. We've been doing it for a good chunk of, well, all of 2022 now. I hope you like the long form once a month episode. We like it. Seems like we've, we're back on track. We enjoy doing them and it's been good. Summer has had its challenges in terms of scheduling. We had some COVID. We had some vacations that were sort of stacked up on top of each other. Lots of different things like that. But I am really excited to talk about Romeo and Juliet. I am really excited to talk about The Green Mile, which is coming up. I hope we'll have those episodes out or or the next one of those episodes out within the next few weeks. We'll just see. It's all about scheduling. I think the booking at this point, I hope, is a show that is worth waiting and, and I hope that when you get an episode, you know, I hope we deliver them consistently on a monthly basis. But I hope if there's a lull here or there, you can understand we live in different towns and we're doing the best that we can. Hopefully the episodes, when they come, are worth the wait. That's my goal is that we provide really high quality over quantity and maybe even over scheduling reliability to some degree if it has to be. But I think the days of quantity over quality which was unfortunately where we were at a couple of years ago, are done. We want to do quality episodes. So uh, look forward to a quality episode, Lord willing, on Romeo and Juliet, quality episode on Green Mile coming up. I am particularly excited to talk about the Green Mile and about Stephen King and all that stuff because weird fiction, man. My relationship with weird fiction. We, we keep circling back to it on the booking every Halloween or so. We talk about it in a spooktacular manner, and I don't know, the thing about weird fiction that had never occurred to me before is it's it's pretty weird. Like, why are all these weird things happening? Who comes up with this stuff? Um, I think actually a lot of weird fiction would be improved by having a explanation at the end, you know, like a quality mystery television program. I mean, you think about Scooby-Doo. scooby do scooby did have great mysteries that were that had solutions at the end they'd pull the mask off turn out there's no ghost there's no werewolf it's just groundskeeper bob and he wants to keep the inheritance in the family or whatever and he would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for the you crazy kids uh, so scooby do have great mysteries scooby don't have a bunch of weird crap that's not explained but i should talk about why we are not doing an episode, like like why the episode's not actually hitting at the right time the, today, which does have to do uh, with Brandon's availability. I don't think he'd mind me saying that um, if he's still in a position to mind those kinds of things. I Well, okay, so I was texting back and forth with Brandon. I was trying to work out a time. I was trying to slide it in right before our vacation. And then the text just go dead. Brandon stops texting, which is unusual. And I call Brandon. This is is just kind of an interesting story. And I don't think Brandon, like I said, wouldn't mind me telling it. But I I call Brandon. I cannot get through. Not only can I not get through, I get, I don't get like the usual voice. Hey, this is Brandon. Uh, You know, leave a, a message after the beep. You know, Brandon's voicemail. I don't get that voicemail. I just get ring, 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 ring rings forever and then it almost sounds like somebody picks up but it's just like a kind of staticky maybe there's some wind maybe someone's breathing i don't know it was weird but as it happens me and my wife are going to bloomington anyway we've got some things to do i won't bore you with what we were going to do but we are headed to bloomington anyway so i think you know what i can't text isn't working for whatever reason maybe brandon's phone is down maybe he's just atypically busy, whatever. Uh, I'm going to just swing by Brandon's house. 
on on the Saturday when we're there. I'm sure he'll be there. We can talk for a second. It'd be nice to see him. We can get the schedule for the rest of the year hammered out in person, which will be the, the best way to do it. And Jake's on board with that plan. So, you know, I, I have a an hour, an extra hour in Bloomington my, while my wife is um, seeing somebody's baby, actually. And I drive to Brandon's house, which is kind of, um, it's not in the country exactly, but it's in a neighborhood that's a little bit off the beaten path. You got to drive through some sort of country road. I don't know if all, all states have this, but Indiana has these roads where you're kind of surrounded by trees and you can see through the trees and you can see houses in the distance. And it's kind of like everybody has a house, everybody has a big piece of property. So you're not in the middle of nowhere, but it, it does have a little bit of that feeling of the forest closing in, of the wilderness closing in a little bit more because it's not just like a residential neighborhood. I don't know if there's a, a name for the kind of neighborhood that involves acres of land and those acres of land being somewhat, depending on the owner, untamed. But that's what you have to drive through. Kind of you, you go outside of town and you're in this more untamed neighborhoods to get to Brandon's house. And I finally pull up at Brendan's house and it's honestly pretty weird because there's two or three cars in the driveway. It looks like everybody's home. There's lights on in the house. There's a, a sprinkler that's running and it smells like somebody was just barbecuing. So I go up and <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, Brandon's here. He's just around the corner cooking something. Um, but I don't actually hear kids playing, which on a Saturday morning, you'd expect to hear kids playing. So it's kind of weird, but I go up to Brandon's door and I knock on it and nobody's there. Nobody answers. Which is really strange because it feels like the house is, is occupied. So I'm just like, I'm imagining different scenarios. You know, it's not that weird. It's like maybe there's a babysitter and they don't want to answer the door. Maybe the kids are just home. It's just, just some, you know, maybe Brandon and Anna went somewhere in one vehicle. There's kids home. And I'm friendly with the Chastain kids. But I, I could imagine a scenario where they're not supposed to open the door. Or they don't answer the door. Or they, they're just, I mean, Brandon's kids are not brats by and large. But when I was the age of some of Brandon's kids, I would do things like this. Like I'm a selfish teenager or whatever. This, this morning, I just don't feel like talking to whoever's at the door i'm not gonna go answer it i'm gonna hide out in my room with the blinds pulled that kind of thing so i knock on the door i ring the doorbell a couple times and one weird thing that happened is that as i went to (laughs) as i went to ring the doorbell a spider went across the doorbell which gave me the the creeps like just scurried across and and disappeared into a a crack in the bricks Uh, not not like a big spider or anything like that but just a spider and when that spider scurried across the the doorbell that made me feel a little bit weird because i I then looked around and i saw they hadn't cut their grass in a little while it looked like things it's not like it was overgrown like there was ivy growing on the walls or anything like that it just felt a little bit overgrown somehow uh unkempt you know like you see your friend in the morning you're not used to seeing him this time of day he hasn't taken a shower yet his hair he you know he still has bed head it's like the whole yard had bed head not in a way that you'd immediately notice like this is unkempt but in a way that felt a little weird to me and and gave me a little bit of a weird feeling uh, especially given that i don't know there's like a famous twilight zone episode where a guy wanders through this town and he keeps coming the locations you know he walks into a diner and nobody's there but there's cigarettes still smoldering in the ashtray and a purse and things like that it looks like people were just there and everywhere he goes somebody was just there and this is really keep creepy episode i think it has like a really lame explanation like it's a dream or something uh, one of the lamer of all the twilight zone uh, payoffs but one of the better of all setups is so whatever for, for whatever reason when the spider scurried across this little brown black spider scurried across the doorbell and went into the crevice. It just, A, it gave me the creeps because I almost touched the spider. B, it just made me uh, feel eerie. I don't know. I mean, it just, uh, just, it just felt like something was out of place. Something was just one degree removed from what it should be about this entire situation. I don't really know how to describe it, but I, the, the, 
hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And it's just like, oh, you know, I started thinking maybe a murderer came and snuck into Brandon's house and murdered. You know, maybe if I opened this door, I'd see the, the bodies of my friends or something like this. You know, this is this is weird. And one thing I should say about where Brandon lives is there's bad cell reception. So part of me was actually thinking about calling the police, but I wasn't going to be able to get out anyway. And also, you know, you're like, it's not actually there's not actually this is silly. There's not actually murdered bodies on the other side of the door. But I'm like, what do I do? Well, the only real thing to do would be to leave. I walked around the back, looked in the backyard. Same deal. Same deal. Just felt a little unkempt. The backyard had bedhead, so to speak. Stick with our, our amazing literary analogy. And only increased my feeling of unease. But... What are you, you going to do? I didn't want to go like peeking in all the windows or anything like that. I, did, I didn't want to surprise anybody. It, it's like there's actually nothing wrong here. They're just not home. They, they didn't know I was going to be here. Maybe, maybe they all left. You know, maybe, maybe somebody cut his figure and they all ran to the car, a different car than the ones that are in the drive. They all went to the hospital and that's where the whole family is right now. But they left all their lights on and they left things kind of running. You know, there's all kinds of good explanations. I, I don't need to call the police. Like I said, I've read too much weird fiction. I've read too much Stephen King. So my mind goes very easily to, well, the, 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 the entire uh, Chastain family is, is dead just on the other side of this door. You know, if I could just look, you know, in fact, there's, there might be even be a killer lurking behind a tree or something, you know, maybe I, maybe I'll get in my car and then he'll lunge up from the back seat or something like that. So I'm feeling a little weird, but I'm also feeling silly about being weird. But at that moment, a voice says, hello. And I would be lying if I said I didn't jump out of my skin because I didn't hear anybody come up. But I turn around and standing in the middle of Brandon's yard, I'm, I'm back facing the, I was facing the front door, but I turn around and uh, standing in the middle of Brandon's yard is this very small guy, not like a a small person, a, a dwarf, whatever the politically correct term for that is, uh, just a small, live, four foot something, going on five feet, probably, guy, small compared to me at least. And he's a very old fashioned kind of a guy, for lack of a better word. He's wearing a straw hat and tall pants, like pants past his uh, kind of slacks with a pleat, but they're past his belly button. So it's a very like 1930s kind of a look. He's wearing a bedraggled old jacket, even though this is, you know, this is July or whatever, but he's wearing like a professor's jacket. A, uh, what, I, what I think of is like the, the, the cool professor look, the kind of patched jacket look. And he's wearing boots and he's got a crumpled pack of Paul Malls unfiltered palm malls sticking out of the pocket of his, his denim shirt. And he's got one smoldering away in his hand. And his fingers are like the guy is probably 40, but his fingers are 60. You know, they are gnarled. They are yellow. They are the, the a quintessential cigarette smokers fingers or, or maybe early onset arthritis. I don't know what it was, but it was weird. And he's not smiling. He's just giving me this tight kind of glare. And anyway, I, I turn around. I probably jump a little bit, but it's not so pronounced that I feel like I have to say, oh, you scared me. I, f I feel like I can play it off. So I say a little bit louder than I mean to. Oh, hello. And he just looks at me uh, for a minute and he says, hello. And he's got a slightly formal manner. I mean, he's not British. He's very American, very hobo, very... 1930s, right? But he's got the formal manner of a hobo, 1930s. You know, he's got a little bit of that butler energy, a little bit of that stillness, that reserve, whatever. But I say, hey, I'm a friend of the family. And he just looks at me and he says, oh, and he's not. He doesn't sound unkind, but also I'm trying to figure out what is going on here. I say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for the Chastines. And he says, they're not here right now. 
And I need to, at this point, I feel like I need to do something to break the ice. So I'm like, hey, I'm Nathan. I'm a friend of Brandon's. Uh, we actually do a podcast together. And I babble on probably like that for a few more sentences. And the guy just looks at me. And then he says, they're not here right now. Again, he takes a really long drag and just gets more smoke out of this Paul Mall than anybody I've seen. I mean, he's drawing deep lungfuls of this smoke and he's letting it out. And it's just, it's like, this guy's a movie smoker. You know, he's really smoking. You know, you can tell an actual smoker inhales it into their lungs and it sort of gets filtered and drawn into the lungs. And then it comes out in a very light vapor. It doesn't come out in these big plumes of like pipe smoke or anything like that. You can always tell a fake smoker because they make all these plumes when in fact... A, a real smoker doesn't do that. They're inhaling it, a lot of it. But there is a old-fashioned kind of smoker that just gets so much smoke off their unfiltered cigarette that they blow out some of it, a big plume of it, and then they inhale from the plume almost, and then so it comes pouring out of their nose, and you know, you're like the true Humphrey Bogart style, old-fashioned smoker. So this guy does that, and I'm just getting hit with the smell, this wall of smell of Pall Malls, which I've smoked a couple times in my uh, drinking and smoking days, but it's, it's not like you just go into the store and get a pack of unfiltered Pall Malls for the most part these days. It's not like you just go into the gas station and get an unfiltered pack of anything. It's not how people smoke, if they smoke at all these days. So I say, are, are you a friend of the family or, or, or a neighbor? So I'm just like trying to break the ice, like I said. And the guy says, just passing through, just passing through, which of course is irritating because it, it doesn't give me any information. And so I say, are you a friend of the Chasteens? Do you know Brandon? And he says, I'm just passing through, just passing through. And at this point, I don't know what to do because who is this? <laughs> who is this guy? Like this actually is a little creepy. And so I don't want to be too confrontational, but also uh, I'm just like, I mean, what would you do? Is it like, well, what is this? Just a homeless guy that walked through Brandon's yard? Like who, what is he doing here? So I say, well, okay, I'm a friend of the family. Is there something we can do for you? And the guy kind of pauses for a second, takes another giant drag off of his Paul Mall, which is about burned down to his fingers now. And he says, no, uh, nothing, nothing you can do. And so I say, well, sir, if you don't have business here, I'm not sure what you're, what you're doing on this property. And he says, business? Business? Who said I, I didn't have business? I say, so do you know the Chasteens? And he says, I did not say that I knew them, sir. And I say, well, because I don't know what else to say. I say, my name is Nathan. And I put my hand out even though I don't really want to shake this guy's scraggly hand. He is feeling more and more like just some, some homeless guy. And he doesn't take my hand but he says, Edwards. And I say, your, your name is Edward? And he says, Ed Edwards. Mr. Edwards. And I say, okay, uh, Mr. Edwards. I, I'm Nathan. Is there something I can do to help you? And he says, no, sir. I, I have business with the family. And I say, Okay, uh, what kind of business is there? Is there anything I can do? I, I don't think that they're home right now. Maybe you'd better come back, which I'm, I instantly kick myself for. Like, we don't want this guy to come back. I could do Brandon a favor by getting this guy not to come back, but I'm just trying to get him to go away now, right? And he says, I had a business with the family, sir. At this point, I feel the need to actually be confrontational. I say, uh, sir, um, Mr. Edwards, you're going to need to leave. And he says, oh, no. Oh, no, that won't do. And I say, what, what do you mean that won't do? And he says, it just won't do. And he smiles at me. There's, there's no humor in this smile <laughs> whatsoever. And I say, sir, I'm going to call the police. Which I know is a bluff because my phone won't even work. I mean, my choices are I can leave and leave Mr. Edwards waiting for the Chasteens or, or whatever. Or I, I could stand there, you know, like, what are my options? I, I don't have cell reception at Brandon's house. He seems to know this. I mean, he doesn't acknowledge it. He just looks at me. 
He smiles a little bit. He nods. And we just stand there. And I'm honestly, it's like, have I stumbled into a dream? What am I supposed to do? And so when in doubt, just try and push through, get somewhere. Even if it means making this guy angry, antagonizing him. Like, what, what else am I supposed to do? So I say, sir, what is your business with the Chastines? And he keeps smiling and he says, what was my business with the Chastines? And the smell of these Pall Malls, the smell of just unfiltered cigarette smoke is thick around me. And there's something else in there, some stench that I, I, I wouldn't even want to try and describe to you, but there is something unwholesome, something diseased about this man. And at this point, I'm actually really scared. And he smiles and he says, do you want to hear a story? And he doesn't wait for me to reply. He begins to tell this story. And he says, in the war, we had to eat and we did get a taste for it. We did get a taste for it. And he says, we were snowed in one winter and there was no way out. And there's this long pause. And he throws his little stump of a cigarette down, although it must have been burning his hands by that point. He gets out another Pall Mall and, and lights it fresh. And I say very carefully, was that the story? I, I thought you were going to tell me a story. And he says, what? And I said, I thought you were going to tell me a story, Mr. Edwards. And he says, didn't I? And now he's being antagonistic. He's got a sick smile on his face. He started, I I wouldn't say laugh, I'd say giggle. He started to giggle, it was kind of a, (laughs) kind of a thing. And, And smoke is coming out of his nose and out of his mouth and he's just giggling. And I'm, I don't know, it was weird. It was just too weird. And I knew that I was being a coward as I did it. But I actually ran. I actually just found myself running into the woods. And and Mr. Edwards is back there just giggling. And his giggles seemed to follow me. And I ran and I ran and I ran. There's there's like woods behind Brandon's house. I ran and I ran and I ran. And I just, it's, it's like a nightmare, right? Like I look back and the house is still there. And there's smoke coming up from the house. It looks like there's billows of smoke like it's on fire or or something like that and i i just keep running and i just keep hearing this giggling in my head i run and i run and i run until i stumble over some branches and, and look into the face of none other than brandon and his family and brandon says hey what are you doing there and i am just so discombobulated right now i realize that my hand is bleeding for some reason i don't know why it's bleeding. I must look like a madman. Talk about unkempt. And the first thing that comes out of my mouth, which is ridiculous, is I came to do some, figure out some scheduling with you. And Brendan is confused, but he laughs and he says, well, I'm, I'm glad you <laughs> found me. This is unexpected. What are you doing in town? And I explained to him. And, 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 and even as we're having this conversation, it's like reality is snapping back into focus. I'm like, did that Mr. Edwards thing even happen? I don't think that that actually happened. And Brandon is talking to me and and, and my brain is kind of zipping around, trying to put pieces into place, trying to make everything make sense. So I'm barely hearing what he's saying, but you know, we're talking about scheduling the booking or talking about what they're doing. I guess the family had just left the house and gone for a hike. And finally I interrupt whatever Brandon is saying. Did you know a Mr. Edwards? And Brandon says, Mr. Edwards. And he turns to his wife and to his kids. Mr. Who's Mr. Edwards? And I say, uh, I think he's one of your neighbors. I just, uh, I saw him and I trail off and I realize I can't explain this. There's no explaining this. And I, I'm not sure that I care to try, especially in front of the kids. So uh, I'm just like, do you know a Mr. Edwards? Is there a neighbor? I just, I thought I, thought I saw him. He, he was walking by, which is a lie. Of course, he was standing in their yard close to their house. And Brandon says, no. And on a total whim, I say, is there a Mr. Edwards in your family? Is there an Edwards that's related to you? And Brandon says, no, no. 
And then he smiles and, and laughs kind of cheerfully. He says, well, there was great-grandfather Edward who fought in the war, in World War II. And I say, okay, what was he like? He was a, he was a Texas boy. I mean, he's, there's, says Brandon, there's nothing to tell. I didn't, I didn't really know him. And I say, okay. And Brandon says, apparently he wasn't a very happy man, but I never knew him. And uh, what else am I supposed to ask? I mean, I don't know. There's nothing else to, there's nowhere else to go with that. So I can't bring myself to actually just have a fun hour with the Chastain family at this point. I just make my excuses and uh, walk back up through the woods. And Brandon says, you know, sure you don't want to stay, uh, you know, have some water, eat lunch with us, whatever. I said, no, I really have to go. I just came here to schedule. So we actually figure out some scheduling for the booking and walk up through the woods and into the yard. And here's the kicker. The, the kicker is that the yard was completely well kept. It had been mown. Everything was in its place. Everything was fresh and new and well kept, you know. And uh, Brandon's wife keeps a wonderful home. She's a wonderful hostess. And they take pride in their work and in their home and all that stuff. And it looked like it. And it made me wonder why I'd ever accepted it not looking like that. And there's no trace of whoever or whatever I saw. So I'm just like, I don't know what to do. Maybe it was just a crazy neighbor or a homeless person that wandered by or, you know, in these times, people are going crazy. We all go a little mad these days. So who knows? I mean, I'm just gonna have to accept that this is an unexplainable thing. But I go, I get into the car, I turn the keys and I look out and my heart jumps And it's not because, you know, Mr. Edwards is standing right there on the windshield looking at me or anything like that. It's actually because Brandon is standing at the edge of the tree line just within sight. And I can't be sure, but it looks like he's smoking a cigarette. And Brandon's never smoked a cigarette in his life that I know of. But he smiles a little bit at me and waves. And I just drove like mad got a a gravel driveway i peeled out i i I drove away and went and got my wife and drove back to evansville and i have not uh contacted brandon since but i assume everything's great and uh i assume he's on the podcast and i assume i didn't see what i saw i assume i am the crazy one And, and it doesn't even make what brandon is mr edwards who was the ghost of i mean it doesn't even make any sense it's uh, weird and doesn't make any sense at all. So anyway, hopefully within the, I don't, maybe I should have told that story. It's kind of a weird story, but uh, definitely a, a, a good use of your time. And hey, I told you this wasn't going to be an ep- a, a real episode of the booking. So you cannot be uh, mad at me for just telling a little story from my life, a true story. Um, anyway, we'll be reading uh, Romeo and Juliet. And uh, the 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 Stephen King, ugh. <laughs> yeah, great Stephen King. I don't know why we decided we were going to put Juvenalia on our list. Kinds of things. Uh, well, and in any case, this is your check in. I hope you get some real episodes in a, a couple weeks. And uh, thanks, thanks for listening. I guess that's all I have to say. Uh, support us on Patreon.com forward slash the Booking, and uh, we'll be back with more episodes soon. Thanks. Bye.